Van <laughs> Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, a new vision of horror from the maniacal minds that brought you Curse of Straw. Explore over 30 domains of dread to terrorize your table, or use the ghastly guide to create your own. Let loose your dark side with all new character subclasses. Unleash fresh nightmares with dozens of malevolent monsters. Pre-order for chilling bonuses and perks. Subscribe to share this twisted content with your table. Face your fears. <coughs> ben Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Pre-order now on the D&D Beyond Marketplace. Or else. <laughs> might be just joining us. Uh, I'm Amy Dallin, and today on Dune D Beyond, we are talking about running one shots, and I am delighted to have Riley Silverman and Satine Phoenix here with me. And if you have some questions for them, we should have a little bit of time at the end to run into some of those. But I do want to know, as we're talking, we've talked about prepping one shots. What do you do once they're in motion? What are your tips for while you're actually running it? What makes it different? What do you approach differently? Or do you do it exactly the same way that you would for a session? I, you. Okay, I think that, like I said earlier, I, I think with a one shot, I do feel a little more pressure to end things in a way that's satisfying for the players, and I can't leave on a cliffhanger that's too much, unless like it's fun, like, oh, like, 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 sometimes it is fun to have a cliffhanger, like, it makes them go, oh, I'm still part of this bigger world, even though my story and this part of it is done. Um, I, I think that I tend to, with one shots, um, I tend to give players more opportunity to use the big fun things on their sheet. Like I think mm. that with one shots, especially because you're not going to be taking long rests or short rests most of the time. I think that if players have a bunch of fun spell, especially if they're playing characters they don't normally get to play or like classes they don't normally get to play and they're trying something out. I kind of want to give them the opportunity to like really go wild with it and have fun with it. And so I think that maybe as a one shot runner, I tend to look for more opportunity to think to let players bring out their big guns than I might if it was a campaign. That's a great tip, helping prioritize the sort of like, if you only get to be this person for three hours, do the full out version of it. You know, <laughs> don't keep that secret for six months later because the rest of us will never know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Jean, what about you? Yeah, you have to think about player agency. One shots are like the ultimate player agency. And you know, when I'm at, when I'm performing in them, I try to show people I'm gonna go through my biggest, baddest spells. Cause if you only have two hours, I don't know, it's more interesting to, go like you were saying just go all out but then if you run out of resources this is how you role play because you know it's it's more interesting to role play when you're out of stuff in my opinion but i like to um hey, riley you're really great and it's like every time you say something i'm like you nailed it <laughs> <laughs> um what I like to do is think about what the purpose is. Is the purpose to, and for me, it's all emotion evoking. Is the purpose to fill them with fear and dread? Am I doing a horror game? Is it comedy? Do I want them to just play and laugh and be absurd? So that's like the first thing that I go into it with. And then I show them that, um, and I actually tell them, like make choices and make them fast and think about it like you're watching TV, right? Everything you see on TV is edited so that everyone buys in at all times. And so just keep buying in. And by doing that, I reward them. So it's just like, they give, I give, they give, I give. And suddenly they're doing, they feel confident to do really wild, absurd things. And I, I specifically like that for one shots. Um, now my ongoing campaigns are different because my whole thing as a game master is resource removal. And so uh, you don't want to do You want to be a little more strategy oriented when you're playing in my game long term. <laughs> ah, that's so interesting. So you, in, you encourage that boldness in a one shot, which I have experienced playing with you. I always <laughs> feel more creative and braver uh, in those games. Uh, but in the long term campaigns, it's it, gives you an opportunity to test out different flavors where in a one shot it's like a smorgasbord of deliciousness and big choices yeah yeah have there been any big lessons that you've learned like did you used to uh, did you once approach planning for one shot in a certain way and then try something and it was like a hilarious failure uh have there been any big sort of changes over time in how you run a one shot 
I think I used to be overcomplicated with them. I remember actually when, when actually when D and D Beyond, <laughs> when when fandom was preparing the documentary about D and D, uh, Joe Star brought me in to run a one shot for the office, like before they got into it. And I thought it'd be really cool to create this like complicated sea battle thing using the like big the group battles like mechanics from the the D, the, the Dungeon Master's Guide. And we had a three hour session, and it was half of one combat because my combat was so elaborate and complicated that we didn't we like by the time they finished it the game was over and so none of my story got to play out and that was my fault because i made the thing too complicated and so the, the combat took too long and so that was like a big thing for me it was like okay don't overdo it like i made that joke earlier about you can always throw combat at something to fill time but you also have to be careful that you don't fill too much time with combat because now you're not doing a one shot anymore now you're just doing a, a battle arena essentially <laughs> yeah that's it yeah, that right there, actually, <laughs> overcomplicating <laughs> yeah. it. And, uh, you know, I I joke about how obsessed I am with D&D Beyond, um, but it's I am serious. I am obsessed. I'm on it all day, every day. And now I go into one shots or just like random games that I'm playing even for multiple times. And um, I now maybe I rely so much on it that I don't have to prepare so much. And that's good, but also, you know, I've been dungeon mastering for a really, really long time. And, you know, if you're just starting to dungeon master, definitely take your time, learn, read through other modules and practice that. But now as an experienced seasoned GM, I'm able to like kind of do things on the fly. You've internalized a lot of the structures that you've used before and a lot of the patterns that you found effective. Yeah. Ah, yeah. what does it look like when you're when you're doing it on the fly? When you're saying because of D and D Beyond, is it sort of like you know that you could just go grab a monster and literally have the sheets and, and yeah, and... <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And yeah. you know, sometimes I'll sit down and I'm like, okay, I've got uh, two hours, and I want them to be inside and outside, so they're going to be moving through a thing. I want them to feel more exploration than combat, so I'm going to throw in some puzzles and I kind of jot things down. Maybe it takes me ten minutes to prepare, and then. And as I'm going, I'm learning what gets them excited. And so maybe at first I was like, maybe some fiends. And I was like, no, I'm going to get like a, a gibbering mouth or something. And then I start moving around. I'm like, oh, no, this monster is going to be this because I've watched how these two players are start. They use something all the time. And I want to be able to reward them for doing that by having something for something there for them to do that, too. So it's almost like DJing monsters for people <laughs> reading the mood and selecting the yeah. next piece that will sort of take it in the direction you want yeah because sometimes it's you know if like in one sh one shots are so specifically different than campaigns i'm really glad that you started this conversation amy uh it's there's you can prepare a serious one shot or you can build an entire one shot around new mechanics that you find in these new books mm -hmm. or you can you know you just have a wild idea like i, I have um uh, I call it my David Lynch mansion. It's just weird. It's just so weird and odd, and it's really fun. And uh, I know the, the the what the mansion looks like. So if they go left or right, I I already have this in my head. I can run the whole thing like this. Um, yeah. I will say, if you're watching this and you, like me, are a relatively newer DM or just <laughs> starting, it's okay if it takes you more than 10 minutes to put the puzzles together. That is something we will all aspire to. Yeah. It should, you know, and that's, <laughs> I, it took me, you know, I developed this 10 years ago, this mansion, right? And so now I can run it like this, but it took me five years to be able to know it. And then once I, I started exploring it even more and I built it about two minutes in front of the other game masters, but you don't know what you're capable of until you try. And so I say, keep going and keep trying and keep expanding your boundaries of what's complicated. And also like, you might fail and you're probably gonna fail. I failed for like three, four years and that's okay. I just admitted like, oh man. And sometimes nobody knows you failed unless you said something. Mm -hmm. That was one big thing I learned. I was like, if I just shut up, everyone thinks I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, the amount of times that like a goof becomes like part of the game. It's like, yeah. oh, I love when that happened. And it's like, oh, I didn't actually find that myself. But all right, cool. Yeah. And also I, to go to Amy's point about not needing to, like you might need more time to prep a game. There is something to be said about running pre-made pre modules for your one shots. If you know that you have a one shot to run and you know that like, like 
you know, you have this time to do it. Like, that's what I did. I got really, really busy in the last month. So when I knew I had this Jasper's game day thing coming up, I have one shots of my own that I could have run, but some of them I've already run on stream before. So I didn't want to repeat some stuff that I've already put out there. So I was like, you know what? I really like this module, Price of Beauty from Candle Keep. So, and it felt really fitting for the tone of what Jasper's game day is trying to do. Cause it's a piece that's all about like personal self image and self worth and stuff like that. And that just felt really like applicable. And so I ran that. And I, I think there is something to be said about that as a tool. If you're getting into this and you haven't done it a lot and you just want that, it's, I, I almost said training wheels, but it's not training wheels because it is also work. And it is, you have to read the module. You have to understand it. And also, I don't think any module has ever really played exactly how it's written in the book. I think the way that you interpret it and the way that you, t as yours, you put your own DM glasses on it, you change stuff around. You might go, you know, I don't really like the way that this character does this thing. And so I'm going to change how they do it, or I'm going to, tailor this more to my players or or I like this idea better and you just have fun with it and that kind of teaches you I think too when you start building your own one shot modules you can kind of go oh I really liked when I did like you know I mentioned that sandbox thing earlier I think that if I hadn't already run a bunch of my own one shots I think that like something like this where it's like oh cool I'm in this space these people are moving around no matter where I go that's something I would have taken forward to other games for sure I love that you brought this up because, of course, a ton of talented people put a bunch of work into making these modules. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Play, <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone has done a lot of the work for you. Although I, I have learned that my prep is very different when I'm running a pre-made because I do, I feel that responsibility to sort of deliver on what they've set up uh, in combination with my own thing. But of course, like you said, no one else is going to run an NPC exactly the way I will. I, it's like. You know, in the world of theater, you can have a million different productions of Hamlet and they're all using the same text, but they're all different because people are bringing new interpretations and bringing new interactions. Uh, and it's it, much more than theater where there is, a, you know, it's going to end the same way pretty much every time. Uh, your your one shot may not be quite that faithful. But anyway, my exactly. point was it will yeah. be different. I have played in modules that I have run myself and I've played in them later and, and I haven't been able to like, it's still it's still fun to play in because the DM does it differently than I would have done it. And like, it's not exactly the same plot, you know, so. All right, yeah, let's I, see, let's get to some questions. Oh, Satine. Oh, I was gonna say, I, I play the same one shot at all the conventions and it is never the same. That's amazing. Uh, actually, I love this question from Aaron Lore. Uh, speaking of Jasper's game day and having watched Satine's game, what do you do when things go totally go off the rails? <laughs> you lean in you just lean all the way in you say yes and oh gosh and you just keep going <laughs> i love that because really off the rails is just to a different location right yeah mm -hmm. now you're just barreling in a different that's what's what's great about things they aren't trains they actually can swerve in any direction you want okay so yeah. this is a specific one fenway used a bean and grew a pyramid in an underground fighting ring ah! in my in my brand new city and broke the building and then put a uh and then did another bean into the mummy's mouth that was in that and then a beanstalk crawled out and they were trying to do this undercover stuff and it broke literally a new city that we're building right now and surety broke it before it even it's even finished <laughs> Yeah. Did you learn something about the city from watching it be yeah. <laughs> broken yes, by the, I did. the yeah. I learned how it dies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good example, too, because like Amy, you said it's not a train. It goes off the rails. Well, even if it is a train, if a train goes off the rails, well, that's your story now. So I think I think that Satine's right by saying lean into it because yeah, like if you and that's like if you look at a one shot as it's about the, the players characters and their story and you had a different story in mind, but they cause something to happen that changes the story entirely. That's correct because it's still their story. And so now, yeah, like your original plan might be gone, but you're like, OK, now this is the story of what these players do to deal with the, the, the city. They just destroyed with the pyramid to Beanstalk. And now we're going to work on that for a little while. And now we're going to sit in the corner and think about what we did. And that's that's a game. So. And if you know the world around you, that's so important. That, that makes it easy. Mm -hmm. Who's going to respond to this and how are they going to respond? Jimmy Tibbs asks, considering time limits in a one shot, what sorts of things can you do to help players quickly get consensus on what to do? How do you help people move along? Impatient characters. Ah, uh, NPCs who are like, come on, we need to move. Yeah. I love that. 
like, well, like Satine said, like if, if events are going to happen, they're going to happen. And so the players stand around talking about something and suddenly the, the, the bank gets robbed. Like, okay, are you going to chase after these guys? You're going to stand around talking about which direction you think they might go. Like you're going to chase them. So <laughs> uh, poison air I, is one of my favorite. Uh, Eberron has the, um, that magic part inside of it. It's like radiation. So yeah, you only got two hours to get out of here. You better get out or you're dead. That's a good one. Or literally I'll put like a timer and I'll sit it there and I'm like, oh, look, there's one minute left. And they're like, ah. Ah, ticket clocks are the best. <laughs> oh, that's great. I don't believe I've ever used an actual physical timer in game, but that would certainly work on me as a player. <laughs> Ravemi asks, or Ra Ravemi? Very sorry if I'm butchering that. How do you end a one shot when you're out of time, but you don't have an ending in sight? I, I think it's really important when running a one shot to really be aware of your own clock as you're playing. And so if you are getting like, say, if you have, if you have an hour left, that's when you need to start be thinking about like, how do I get to stuff? And that's why earlier when I was talking about what I consider when I'm structuring a one shot, I, I always go, how do I resolve this thing if these other things don't happen? And so, yeah, I think I think that that is part of your planning process ahead of time so that you know that like, OK, I know this is where the story is going to end, or I know this is where things are going to happen at. Like, so what version of that can I do with that? Like I did when we did my show Monday, we definitely were running out of time and like, we did not have time to run combats. And so we, you know, I don't want to, we were the last show of the night, but I didn't want to make our, our tech person stay up super late to be with, because they were on the East coast time too. Um, so I just kind of, I kind of like, did like a chase montage where I still let the players describe what they were doing to get out, but we just didn't roll dice for combat. We had like, we gotta go, we gotta go. This is all gonna happen. We have to get this guy out of here. And so, you know, you kind of fast chase forward through some of the action. Great idea. Yeah. I try to keep, uh, I try to keep time about uh, 30 minutes and then 20 minutes. And just like Riley, Riley, you're like, you're reading my mind. It's great. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I keep time, and but I keep track. Now it's like 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and I start moving the world so it speeds up a little bit. And um, yeah, I, I hate when I have to take away too much, but things are going to happen, and they either see it from here and stop it from happening, or they see it from here and it happens without them. I love that. Sarah Tony asks, how do you get better at yes anding or rolling with the punches. I tend to get stuck when things do go differently, especially when the game is on a timeline. And I relate to that because I have had to learn over time that the chaos I love as a player, I, I was surprised when I started DMing how different it felt because suddenly if my plan isn't going, I would feel that insecurity of like, oh no, if the thing that I improvise isn't as satisfying as what I had planned, I will be disappointing everyone. And partly that just came a little bit with experience of sort of trusting that myself and my players will all have each other's backs and reminding myself that certainly as a player, I have very rarely left a table not being like, the DM, you know, any DM who's really trying to give everyone a good play experience, usually if you're all on board, very bad tables accepted, let's not talk about them. But like the vast majority of the time, I you leave the table being like, that person really wanted me to have a great time. And we all helped each other really have a great time. And you find those moments and it's going to go fine. And remembering that from the other side just an experience built my confidence, but do you have any practical tips for getting better at that rolling with it yes and part? I'll let Satine go first so I don't say what she's planning on saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just shows that you're, I, I think you're a great dungeon master. <laughs> um, yeah, it, this is where I have to pra practice mindfulness. So there's a humility that you have to have as a game master. It's easy to fall into the controlling dungeon master trope. And all of a sudden, like, they're not doing the thing that you want them to do. Why wouldn't they? It's obvious to do this. Well, maybe they're not doing it because you didn't give them an, enough threads. Oftentimes, especially for one shots, I will give them the quest before they even start. They all know what they need to be doing. If they're running around doing a bunch of different things, maybe that was on you. And that's okay that it's on you, but you just have to have the humility to say, okay, this is what I did. This is how I can do it better next time. If you find yourself saying no a lot, why do you say no a lot? Um, or if you find yourself overruling things and you're not as lenient with rules, um, that said, there are players that take too much advantage of that. Yeah. But, you know, it's okay to kind of let go and let loose. 
practice one game that we all only thing you do is yes and now okay yes and this if this happens then this happens but you don't want to just give it to them and give them like a whole smorgasbord of freedom you also have to show consequences yes you can totally do that that guard over there just saw you do that now you're getting chased through the streets so um but you also don't want to over punish it's a dance definitely you'll you learn how to dance i love that riley yeah, I think uh, I think you both said is wonderful, and I, I totally agree. And I think Amy, what Amy said, you said earlier about like as long as you're trying to work towards everybody having a good time, and you are people aren't going to notice that you as a DM yes handed too much, and you don't know what you're doing anymore. Like like <laughs> like and like Satine said earlier, like no one knows usually when the DM is is improving because usually like it just seamlessly flows. And I, I know we're running low on time, so I just want to say that I think that I think it's really good whenever you're building an encounter, especially in one shots, to really go okay. If this is successful, this is great. But what if it's if it, what if every single encounter in this entire one shot fails? Can I still tell this story? And if you can, then you probably have a pretty good one shot. And so if you yes and things and people find their way around everything, if you've prepped it in that way, you're going to have a satisfying story and it's going to be fun. I love that. Oh, thank you both so much for joining me. We do have to wrap up for today, but please, can you tell the people where to find you? Thank you both, by the way, for running those wonderful Jasper's one shots for Jasper's Game Week, which is still going on all week and you should support if you can. Riley, where can the people find you? They can find me on Twitter at Riley J Silverman and on Instagram at Riley Silverman. It's a Team Phoenix. And you, got you can find going me on right now. <laughs> Funny you ask that. Uh, you can find me at Satine Phoenix everywhere, satinephoenix.com. But most important, it's my very first Kickstarter. Um, it's Sirens Battle of the Bards at thebardbook.com. It's a fifth edition campaign and setting that's uh, bardtastic and for, bard, uh, for non bard friends as well. So go ahead and check out thebardbook.com. I can personally vouch. Yeah, I've gotten. I love the sirens so much and you all <gasps> do too. And this book you, is going to be amazing. And I'm just personally very excited about it. All. You so performed cool. with us. Yeah. You sang. You, were, <laughs> you and um, Jason Charles Miller were a team. <laughs> was really one, of, great. one of my very favorite memories. Thank you all for joining us. If you enjoyed this, please hit the likes and the follows everywhere you can. Keep tweeting me uh, your questions because I love to hear people's own uh, answers to our topics uh, because you all have a lot of wisdom to offer in this area too. And thank you so much for joining us on D&D &D Beyond. <laughs> Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. A new vision of horror from the maniacal minds that brought you Curse of Straw. Explore over 30 domains of dread to terrorize your table. Or use the ghastly guide to create your own. Let loose your dark side with all new character subclasses. Unleash fresh nightmares with dozens of malevolent monsters. Pre-order for chilling bonuses and perks. Subscribe to share this twisted content with your table. Face your fears. Ben Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Pre-order now on the D&D Beyond Marketplace. Or else. <laughs>